Welcome to the FMCG Guys, the podcast that dives into the innovation, strategy, and trends shaping consumer goods and retail in Europe and beyond. Welcome to the FMCG Guys podcast. I'm Daniel Torres. Hello, Christina Nicola. How are you? Hi, Daniel. I'm doing well. Very much looking forward to the holidays. No kidding. Actually, when you speak, when, when you hear this, we'll probably be over the holidays. So hope you've all had a nice season break, uh, which seems season seems strange to say now that we have it in front of us. But anyway, um, thanks for joining us in yet another episode. We have reached probably by the time this is now 10,000 followers on LinkedIn. So thank you everyone for the support. Uh, and if you haven't yet, remember to actually subscribe to this podcast on your listener. I think you just have to click the subscribe button on Apple or Spotify. And if you're hungry for more FMCG content, if you can't get enough of the FMCG guys, remember we have a sister podcast, the CPG guys at the other side of the Atlantic where Sri, Peter and Brian have a huge amount of knowledge themselves. And they have an audience of over 25,000, which makes ours seem small. So, um, Christina, very excited about the chat today as well. We'll be talking about digital and FMCG. What's your take on the evolution of this conundrum? Well, I guess uh, it's kind of a big passion for me uh, based on uh, my background. Um, it's clear that there has been this huge boom during the pandemic. We saw a big change and a big frenzy for everybody to digitize their business suddenly. And uh, I, although the growth rates have rationalized a bit, I do believe that it's a change of habits that is happening. Also now as with the new generations coming into the consumer base, we get to see more and more of that. There are some markets such as China, where in, even in FMCG, um, e-commerce is close to like, what, 20% of their sales. And while it's still smaller in Europe, uh, there are some markets that are more mature and in the rest, it's still growing. It's growing quite fast. Um, and the growth rates are way faster than the ones that we see in the offline world. So for sure, it's an opportunity. It's also a big challenge for most uh, uh, companies as it requires a change in the way of thinking and uh, how we bring together different parts of the organization as if you ask most of them, digital, I guess, would sit with the media team and sales would sit with the sales team and those two would not be speaking to each other. Yeah, especially now that we're talking more and more of like the full funnel aspect of online, right? Which, exactly. Yeah, what reinforces that. So. Yeah, we're lucky to have uh, Vitali Novikov with us today. I think that he'll have a very uh, interesting perspective on the evolution of digital in FMCG because he's heading up uh, digital at no other than the Coca-Cola Hellenic company, which is one of the famous beverages main bottlers worldwide. I'm Vitaly Novikov. Uh, I'm Digital Commerce Director for Coca-Cola HBC for the group. Thanks for joining us, Vitaly. And for the audience to get to know you a bit better, what does it mean uh, to be the Digital Director at Coca-Cola Hellenic? And uh, and yeah, tell us a bit about, about your life in Switzerland. Uh, sure. So uh, digital commerce uh, is um, a relatively new uh, area. It's a relatively new business unit, just a couple of years. And uh, it is a combination of several pillars. It's uh, uh, one pillar where we sell to e-retailers and collaborate with food service aggregators. And that's the most straightforward one, where we actually sell to our digital customers. We help them drive business. And this is close to offline business in a way. It's like selling to large customers in offline, uh, winning market share, creating joint value creation strategies. And then there are other pillars that are a bit more uh, distant from the traditional core business of line. One is B2B, where we build our own B2B platforms and deploy them to support our route to market. So we build the digital leg to support the physical leg of our route to market. Uh, and that has several sub pillars for direct route to market, for indirect route to market. So you start to talk pure B2B, 1P platforms, you start to talk 3P marketplace platforms, and they are the things that we build, deploy, um, and then use to digitize the services we offer to our distributors and all the way to the point of sale. Uh, 
Uh, we are a B2B business, so the bigger part of our digital commerce is, of course, in B2B. That said, we do have also a D2C lag where it's selected, um, I would not call them pilots, it's more than pilots, but they're not scaled like to every market like our B2B is. So selected initiatives and programs where we experiment going directly to consumer. Uh, selling beverages, but not only. We have, um, for example, a venture investment minority, but strategic minority shareholding in an e grosser in Austria. Uh, and that's, of course, beyond uh, the, the portfolio of only Coca Cola, Hellenic. They sell everything and our products as well. And we are minority shareholder. That's in D2C. And we do have our own platforms where we sell beverages directly to consumers which is of course trickier because selling beverages alone must have a reason why people want to buy beverages alone and then uh, make a profitable sale of a small drop of beverage to home is not such an easy feat. Uh, that's why it requires experimentation, understanding, and that's why this D2C lag is something where uh, there is a series of um, always pilots going on. Uh, we also digitize our vending fleet uh, we have quite a substantial vending fleet. And if you dream a little bit, any cooler of Coca-Cola that is in the market can become uh, a virtual mm -hmm. vending machine that you can digitize through an app. We do things like that. We develop solutions like that together with Coca-Cola company. So that's also part of our D2C programs. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, there is the, the leg that is called digital commerce capability, where we build and codify knowledge where we scale this knowledge because part of uh, digital commerce is to develop acceleration of business. And part is to build capability and trans transform the core business, make the non-digital people more digital in a way. And that's another pillar of digital commerce. So all of it together strategically constitutes digital commerce. And my previous experience is actually uh, very different. It's my first digital role. Uh, I worked for three beautiful companies in my career. The last one is Coca-Cola HBC, where I have been since 2011. Uh, the previous one was Johnson & Johnson. And before that, I was with Henkel in the detergents division. And um, uh, before coming to the corporate role, uh, I at the group, I did anything you can imagine in commercial, from working the streets and being sales rep to being key account manager, We've been root to market manager, sales director. Then I did everything imaginable in marketing, classical marketing, brand management, marketing director, marketing management for a number of countries. So at international level, and uh, I can safely say that in commercial, my expertise is very strong. Uh, I know the ins and outs and how things work. I worked uh, always in Europe in quite a few geographies. So I was in uh, six, seven, I think, different countries. Uh, but always in Europe. So I'm not global, but Europe I know very well, emerging, developed, you name it. And um, then I came to the corporate role uh, and, uh, and we started building this digital journey. Uh, and we considered, some people who are smarter than me probably considered that I was good for the job and I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to match this pitch. This is all very impressive, Vitaly, and I, I understand why people might consider you to be the right person for the job. What, but what kind of like uh, drew you into this role and into this whole digital journey? Because it's very innovative, but it also comes with lots of challenges, right? Yeah, uh, I guess that's exactly that's exactly it, right? For me personally, one of the biggest drivers and motivators for my career and the reason I chose to do what I do. Not the only one, of course, we all also need a salary and uh, and make an impact and, 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 and so on. But one of the big drivers for me is learning. So mm -hmm. whatever really gets me going and excites me is learning. And learning means it needs to be unknown. It needs to be something we haven't done before. It needs to be something problematic to solve. Um, that's what I was doing when I was in non-digital roles, transforming, turning around, restructuring. And that's uh, what every second is with uh, digital commerce today. It's still a very new, fast growing field, a uh, field where vertically and horizontally things happen all the time. And what seems to be um, an established fact yesterday is, is changing today. Uh, the economics works different. You don't have the diminishing return on scale. Uh, actually, it's the opposite network effects. And uh, at some point, you know, your return 
is not proportionately decreasing as you get bigger, but it, go, it goes exponentially up. So completely different laws. Um, and uh, in digital, you can try many things. So, so you can try, fail, and try and succeed very, very fast. You can do 24 seven things uh, that in physical world require, you know, physical input. So it's an exciting field. Uh, and, uh, and that was one of the biggest drivers for me to do it. Even in the previous non-digital roles, of course, I was looking for new and innovative ways to address commercial problems or opportunities. And uh, this was one of the reasons why, why I was interested and why the company believed uh, that uh, I, I could be the person to lead it. So it's a combination mm -hmm. of opportunity, my desire to learn, and uh, uh, the right time, the right place. I guess it's a combination of things as always. Are you a savvy consumer insight professional with an interest in AI applications and market research? Discover Bullchat AI, the pioneering AI-powered qualitative consumer research platform that's reshaping the consumer insight landscape. Picture this scenario, effortlessly connecting with your target audience, posing bespoke questions, and receiving insightful responses to address your business queries, all neatly compiled into an actionable report within a mere 24 hours. Bullchat AI streamlines the research process, enabling you to make agile, well-informed decisions at a fraction of the conventional cost. Curious to experience the efficiency firsthand? Visit www.bullchatai.com and embark on your free trial today. And I think I think you're selling yourself a bit short here, Vitali, because you were actually a general manager for 10 years, which is quite important. You were the general manager of Baltics, Poland, and then and then Italy, which are major businesses, especially Italy, for uh, Hellenic. That's uh, for Hellenic. I was also managing director for Johnson & Johnson. <laughs> so, yes, I have done... Many I think you are. So I, I sold you. I, even I sold you short. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have quite some operational experience. As I said, I did everything in commercial, and I, of course, was leading country operations. I was country general manager, both in Hellenic in three big markets and uh, in Johnson and Johnson as well. I was actually starting up uh, Johnson and Johnson consumer in Ukraine. Yeah. So, like now, in perspective, now that you're uh, a digital director, or it could be called chief digital officer in another company, if you like. From your perspective, do you think that it should be, like for companies, it should be somebody that comes in internally and is developed from another function into a digital role? Or it should be like the digital specialist that basically goes from company to company making a transformation? It depends, right? I think it depends on the context, it depends on the task at hand, it depends on um, personalities. Um, I, I, will, I, I will say some things that are quite obvious, but they do have an impact, right? Uh, one question is how big is the company, how strong it has of a culture, what are the ways of working, do people depend on existing networks to get things done? Uh, is the company entrenched in traditional ways of doing business and you, 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 you expect that there will be resistance to change when you start a digital transformation journey? Uh, are there any rudimentary capabilities already? Okay, maybe not advanced, but rudimentary digital capabilities. Are there systems in place? So how is the overall context? Depending on this, you choose your journey. I'll give you an example. If the company is uh, heavily dependent on... Um, internal networks to get things done, an outsider who comes without a network and uh, with something very new that people haven't done before, with, with natural skepticism, especially if it's a successful business already and people do not have the urgency to change, then it may be difficult to succeed, right? If, on the mm -hmm. other hand, you have an organization that is very decentralized, many things are happening, it is clearly suffering and it is clear in performance and it, it clearly knows that it is suffering because it's missing out, missing out on digital transformation opportunities. Sort of the ground is prepared and then an outsider with strong credentials to having done this before um, can come and make an impact faster. So you, you always need to choose, right? It's always, I think it depends on the context. There is no magic bullet. 
it's about bringing like either an external point of gravity, let's say, to pull everything together when the infrastructure is there or the base is there, or otherwise trying to transform from within and even get people to try to disrupt themselves, I guess. And that's where you need that level of trust and understanding of the inner workings of the organization, as you say. Uh, yeah. When I was in the, um, and that's one point that we were discussing before the podcast, right, that I think is very interesting for our listeners as well, is how do you really set up that kind of infrastructure? And data is a big pain point. When I was in the agile, that was kind of like the biggest task that we had to do, like figure out how we get all the e-commerce data worldwide and have a single view of what our business is, how performance works. So what are the challenges you see? Uh, we know that it's not the same as with just the big retailers that serve data to Nielsen and then you can get them consolidated. Mm. Yeah, so um, there, is a, there is this paradox with digital commerce and data. On the one hand, literally anything that happens online and digitally in commerce or not in commerce, it stays there forever. So you have data traces mm -hmm. of pretty much anything. And that's what I teach my 11 year old daughter, that be aware, <laughs> whatever you do online will never go away, good or bad. So just be aware, just don't assume there is such a thing as privacy in the digital world. On the other hand, so there is data and data means there is potential to create insights, there is potential to react much faster, there is potential to create new things, there is potential, my head is, you know, is, is, uh, uh, is turning when I imagine the potential of the data that is out there. Then when you look at that practically and you say, okay, so between data is out there and I have insights that can drive my particular business, what is in between? And in between there is a huge gap. You mentioned one example that Nielsen does not provide online data to the extent and granularity and even timeliness as they do with offline, which is actually weird because digital data is more available. That's one example. Another example is there are so many systems through which we capture data from backend accounting systems to front end POS systems. So there is a lot of data, but it's in all the different systems. Integrating it and matching it is much more tricky than one might assume. So answering your question, I think having the vision and understanding and conviction that data can create insights that can create completely different speed of business development and opportunities, this conviction must be a starting point. And this conviction is very needed because then that conviction will be needed to go through excruciating effort and painstaking effort of mapping the data strategy, integrating the hardware systems, integrating the software systems, having a million setbacks and understanding how much more complex it is every time you peel one layer and you're trying to come to a simple solution, you realize that integrating various data sources is much more complicated. But with conviction, you will eventually be able to formulate your data strategy to understand, start with your strategic needs, then understand what is the strategy to achieve those needs. Then you will be able to map your data systems architecture that will be uh, you know, in line with your cost possibilities, how much you can pay, and in line with your business needs. And then you will understand how detailed and granular you will go. Uh, and only then you will be able to start leveraging your data from digital commerce to drive insights and business opportunities. But there is a lot of devil in the detail of systems integration, data matching, having a clear data strategy and understanding your data sources uh, and not taking it for granted, not assuming that this is just magical. You know, I click and I, I get everything. It's not happening like that. Yes, exactly. And I guess like for many people, the, the, the paradox that you mentioned is what makes them very surprised because they think like it's digital, so data must be there. And I don't understand why you don't have it. But then when you look at it, it's so fragmented. There are multiple duplications. There are shadow PLs to the actual PLs. You might have retailers selling, uh, selling across different platforms and double counting when they are selling your data with you. So question also to our listeners, if you have found the solution to that and how to do it, leave it up in the comments and data what a i want to read i want to read the comments after this question yes <laughs> yeah well they can actually send us like on our linkedin page there's an inbox now that they can send it us send it to so just go to our linkedin page and write a, a message to the inbox honestly we'll answer right it's not just saying and data by the way what a short word for such a complex topic <laughs> when did that ever happen 
Um, and another, another structural thing, if you like, in e-commerce, what about the digital infrastructure, the technology? Uh, is it that important to have like super cutting edge technology internally for an FMCG company to be successful online, considering that practically all the sales are through partners? Um, I'll tell you my honest opinion. It's an opinion of a practitioner, of course, but I don't, uh, I don't assume I have the universal truth and wisdom. I really believe that technology is important, but a particular technology or the particular technology that will make all the difference. Uh, no, I don't believe in that. I believe that there is uh, plenty of solutions for any business needs. I think it's much more important and critical to formulate the business problem or the business opportunity or the questions that need to be asked, uh, answered, or the problems that need to be solved. And there is plenty of data solutions for any of that. And it's about orchestrating it in a way, if you are a scaled business like ours, it's about asking the right questions and having good enough technology to answer those questions. And it's about making sure that you think ahead and that your business strategy and your systems strategy are aligned so that mm -hmm. you can scale whatever solutions you find. Because the pitfall can be you get excited about a thing that can solve a small problem here and now, and it's great. Then another system or tool or technology can solve another problem tomorrow, and it's also great. And then another one the day after tomorrow, and then you sit on uh, 5,000 solved problems and 5,000 technologies for them, and you cannot scale it. So the impact actually of any scaled organization is in the fact that you select questions and problems smartly, you select one or two scalable tools, the fewer the better, if you ask me, and there is no magic bullet, remember, and technology is less important than understanding the business need and problem, and then scaling it. That's, uh, you know, <laughs> traffic is king. If you think even of Amazon flywheel, it's very clear that the more traffic you generate, the more relevant you become. The more traffic you generate, the more relevant you become. Technology is there, but uh, if you have if you have already an established model, I mean, you can always adapt your technology. It's not a problem. And in, on the specifics, like what would you say are the top three things? For example, like having a PIM, working with a content syndicator, getting something to monitor your digital self. Like if you would suggest to our listeners, like one priority, if a big company starts digitizing, what would they yeah. do for ecom? Yeah, yeah. So I understand by your question that we are we are now in that pillar of uh, managing e-commerce, e-retail, yes. food service aggregators because right. and there are other pillars, right? On that, like, on that all front, B2B yeah. B2B platforms and, and then the, the answer would be different. Uh, if you're talking about e-retail and uh, food service aggregators, which is where we collaborate with existing digital players, well, you follow... In CPG, you follow the logic of your offline business, ironically. So what, what uh -huh. does it take to win in offline when you are a branded goods company? You need to have nice brands. They need to be visible. You need to have high-quality products distributed. So you need to have basics of distribution. And then they need to be activated. They need to have good displays, speak to shoppers. That's offline. Online, you need exactly the same things. And even you have more opportunities because... You can offer more. There are search options that you don't have in offline that are instantly available. Uh, there is more opportunities to create beautiful execution of your digital shelf, so more visual. All of these things have the same logic. Then once you have executed them, you need the tools to measure it, right? If you do it at scale, it's not about making one beautiful activation. It's about having scaled distribution everywhere. It's about having scaled product descriptions that are right everywhere. It's about having scaled brand images that are consistent everywhere. So you need tools that can basically scrape the web and give you the output on your target metrics of execution. And this is a must. And these tools must work everywhere, in every country, for any retailer. And then you know where you stand and you actually can sit down with the retailer and say, hey, we can improve because the index based mm -hmm. on our metrics is 90 instead of 100. Let's do things to take it to 100. Shoppers will be excited. So you need tools to measure execution online. That's quite simple. And this is the basics of it. Uh, and from my knowledge, most companies don't even have that to start with. So you define your picture of success, your digital shelf, and then you measure how you execute against it. You need tools for that. Uh, the more advanced version starts when you start to ask the question, how can I integrate my branding programs 
with my commercial activities. So how can I make sure that my digital marketing activation, something that I show, for example, on any channel on YouTube, has this little element there that says, by the way, if you click here, you will get an exclusive offer and you can drive a commercial transaction. These kinds of integrations sound simple, but they require more sophisticated tools. That's the next level. What I would say is it's important to crawl before you walk, walk before you run, and run before you start jumping two meters high. Um, and scaling a basic tool that tracks your execution and takes your basics of execution to the next level before you go to advanced integration of branding and commercial activities will give you better output than if you do a little bit of this here, a little bit of that there, and you have 15 programs that all make sense, but each of them is small. It's just complexities that will not give you the output of the critical mass. But I love where you're going with all that, actually, because a really big conversation that we used to have when I was in digital was e-commerce, is it just a sales channel or is it across the funnel? So I would love to hear your opinion on that, because we know that a lot of people are going online to search for a product first, and they might end up going to their local supermarket and buying, but they need to find the right information. They would see the images that you have in a retailer shop, especially in Amazon. I know that in Eastern Europe, we don't get Amazon, but we know we have seen this trend happening a lot, right? Amazon being the number one search engine. So I'm wondering how important is all those baby steps that you mentioned, like making sure that you have the right picture, the right content, the right information, you show up the way that you want to show up in a physical store. How is it important is it for your overall sales? and not just whatever you're counting on your e-com line in your PNL. Uh, well, it goes without saying that it is important because a uh, consumer or shopper is the same person, right? I think it's a, it's a very intellectual mistake uh, and illusion of professional marketeers, if you know it's professional deformation, that they say, well, there is ATL and brand building, then there is BTL exactly. and, and commercial activity. They are two different things, two different strategies. It's the same person that gets exposed to it, right? So, so you need to see it holistically by default and absolutely critical. And again, starting with the consumer and the shopper and the fact that they are exposed 360, 360 to all possible stimuli, whether they are brand or commercial, they may not even know. They see, you know, brands and, and that stays with them, what they see and how they see it in that context. Now, with all this, it is very important to understand, starting from the consumer, your strategy. Do you actually, it's not that every category and every brand will benefit from having an overproportionate share of sales on e-commerce channels. Mm -hmm. For some brands and categories, you actually don't want it. And then yet, you say, well, I don't want to have sales through the channel for whatever reason. That said, my consumers will be visiting those sites. So do I want them to never see me there? Or do I want to have a specific exposure to my brands there? Then you can start and say, well, then maybe I need only some SKUs and only some brands there, but I have some completely different look of success in my physical. But that depends on your strategy, right? For some other products, it may be, no, 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 no. Right. I must win in online. Like if you sell appliances and you don't, think of selling online, I think, okay, you may have a problem. So you say, yeah, yeah, for me, this channel maybe is even more strategically important. Then the question will be, and I'm not in, obviously, in, in household appliances, but I imagine how it works. I know how it works. Then your question will be, okay, if I push my e-commerce sales because they are very important, what will be my pricing strategy? And what will it do to my overall profitability if this channel happens to be less profitable than the core that I sell offline? It may drive me out of business, and there are examples of that. So before I make it big, let me maybe define what are the criteria to make it profitable. And maybe when I define those criteria, I will realize, hey, my speed of growth is not enough to win market share. What do I do then? It requires answering these questions before you start pushing mm -hmm. it. And, and what, what, is, what is typical of e-commerce and online channels, they grow fast, very fast. They grow fast. So whenever you look at it in isolation, you feel that you are super successful and you are doing the right thing. But unless you understand the strategic position in end to end, the impact on your brand perception, the impact on your financials, the impact on your future business model, you can be left in a situation where if you're lucky, you are more profitable, but more likely you lose all your money without understanding how it happened to you. So it requires thinking ahead and it requires proactive management. You cannot just run after everything that is shining. 
I hope I'm making sense to you. Absolutely. And we talk a lot about like, because here we interview a lot of people in FMCG, but also a lot of people in, in retail, like in fashion, luxury, and so on. We're there, it's super important to create um, this type of seamless experience. Like, is there is there any secret to doing that in FMCG in terms of like, yeah, I don't know, talking to a consumer all the time and that it's the same that they do it online or in store? Uh, well, there is no, again, a secret formula, no. I wouldn't say it. the secret, not the secret, but the, what do you call it? The secret of Polish and I, right? The secret everybody knows about is you need to really understand very well who your consumer is, who your shopper is, is it the same or different people, and what are the occasions in which they consume and shop. If you start from that and you can draw it, you can literally, like, conceptually draw a picture of your life where you understand where your brands and products enter their life and what are the interaction points. And then you need to understand what will be your physical store look of success, right? And what will be your digital store look of success, but they're not two separate things. They're part of, it's that consumer and shopper in the middle, and that's how you define it. In CPG, you know, CPG sounds like it's a one thing, but there's so many, like, for, for, for for confectionaries and snacks, it will be very different to beverages. And then uh, for detergents and cosmetics, it will be completely different. Uh, and the drivers sometimes can be the opposite in, 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 in across these categories. So what works very well for one is what kills the other one. Uh, there is no universal, uh, there is no universal answer. It needs to be developed, I would say, in a tailor-made way, having consumer and shopper and point of interaction, digital or physical, in mind. And staying a bit on the e-retailer part, uh, I think that one of the biggest topics we've had in the podcast lately is uh, retail media. And it's kind of like a really big buzzword as well, but it's also a big pain point when it comes to who's handling it. Because you have a key account manager who's handling a JPP like a contract with a, re with a retailer, and that goes on the regular things like the products you're selling and what promotions you do in store. And then you have a separate person usually from the retailer side who's doing retail media. How can we, first of all, how do you see the future? Like, do you see those merging or staying separate? And what do you think is the best way for a company to approach it? Uh, I do believe that um, whatever any practitioner on the supplier side, me included, thinks about it, is less relevant to how our customers decide to organize it. Mm -hmm. So if they decide that it will be two separate departments, uh, we will have to live with this. That said, um, that said, I'm convinced that uh, long-term and well, long-term business relationships can only be built if you look at the business end-to-end. -end. So be it two different departments, so one department on the other side, we need to bring them together. We need to discuss our business end to end together. And even if individually these departments do not understand it, it's our task as suppliers to explain that, guys, the more you pay here, the less you will get in the other place. And are you sure that you want to optimize it with a hide and seek game? We, we should rather come and have a conversation about what kind of business we are building, going back to what I said before. We are targeting together our shopper and consumer, and we want to maximize the value for them. To maximize the value for them means knowing what they do, how they do. This means we need to understand data in order to create a better offer for them. Then we need to invest in perfect activation for them. All of these things can and must be quantified, but they need to come into one end-to-end -end pot if you want, if you want to find an optimal solution. If, on the other hand, somebody says, listen, it's my business and I want to drive it transactionally. You want to sell through me, give me whatever, 80% discount. Uh, and if you want my data, give me 5 million X units. Otherwise, I will not give you the data. If I see situations like that, I will probably I will probably think, okay, this how sustainable is this? Like, is it really a way to build a long-term sustainable business? Probably not. And then I will start deprioritizing that and going after opportunities where we can work on it end to end together. So I do believe, to, to answer your question, there is a huge value in being able to talk to shoppers and consumers directly through a retailer's platform, and the data they generate is very valuable. It has value. I'm not saying it's, it does not have value. 
But I'm saying this value should be seen in the context of end to end, and it should not be seen speculatively like I buy three clicks, I pay you five dollars. I mean, it's uh, I don't see how it can work long term. That's my view. Mm -hmm. And what about like Q commerce, rapid delivery? How do you see this channel? Because this is one of the ways that arguably you can have going back to like the dialogue with the consumer and being close to the consumer. This is one of the ways that some voices think that that a company like Coke can really like see what have the finger on the pulse of like what the consumers like. Yeah, no, I've, well, the channel, I personally love this channel from where I am. It's a fast growing channel. It addresses a real consumer opportunity, obviously for, uh, for CPGs in the beverage industry. Uh, especially the food delivery to home, it's it's an opportunity not only to create extra sales, but more importantly to create extra consumption occasions. Because uh, in beverage, uh, you 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 often have impulse consumption occasions. So it's a great opportunity. It creates value for consumer. It creates value for us. I see it very positively. If you are an operator in this uh, sector, of course, it's a bit trickier because you need to make sure that your unit economics works, right? We, we saw a lot of consolidation and a lot of uh, dynamics in uh, quick commerce and uh, food service aggregators because uh, because as exciting as it is for consumers and from, from occasion growth perspective, uh, it is uh, quite tricky to make this business model work profitably. And uh, those that know how to do it, uh, they will benefit, I'm sure, and we have great partnerships. We have amazing. I do believe that these platforms, because they talk to consumers and shoppers directly, create also amazing opportunities for brand activations to communicate the messages in a way that is relevant to consumers. So uh, I believe like many things come together: brand communication, occasion communication, real consumption in the right moment, creating beautiful moments with families when you order food home and have a better. I mean. You can do romantic marketing stories, and you can make more transactions. It's uh, it's a great opportunity. Profitability of that model for operators is, uh, of course, not an easy task. And huge respect to them working hard to figure it out. Yeah, I think you're spot on on that. And we saw this in uh, the past years in Europe. <laughs> During COVID, we had all those startups popping up everywhere. And then we went through a round of uh, major takeovers and a lot of them going bankrupt, uh, a lot of M&As in that space. So I guess uh, the ones that really figured out figured it out are the ones that will now remain and then will be able to really provide both the consumer shopper and consumer value, as well as the value to the brands, as they are a really incredible tool that you can use. A lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of mopeds have had to be repainted in these years, going from one operator to the next. True, true, very true. Uh, and it's still happening, I guess, like uh, we haven't seen the end of it, uh, but uh, the picture is way clearer versus what it used to be in the past. And that helps a lot also with partnerships, I guess, because you can centralize a lot more stuff uh, versus uh, the past, especially also in Eastern Europe, right? Um, yeah, you can, but you I can just go faster, right? You say centralize, it's true. I see it, I see it a bit differently, a bit more positively. Yeah. You can go faster. Right, because centralizing yeah. to centralize and say, okay, no, well, you may centralize to cut costs. That's not that case. You can just go faster. If it's an international player, you can agree one exciting thing, and then you say, let's roll it out in seven countries at the same exactly. time without having to agree one by one. And it actually creates more impact. The synergy of international activation is creating even more excitement for consumers. So it works for everybody. Yes, I believe there are big opportunities when these platforms are scaled and you have good collaboration. And connecting with what we were saying before, it's also the data part. It's way easier when you have a single provider that at some point can give you the insights you need rather than going to multiple different startups um, and trying to understand what's happening in that uh, area. Um, but let's uh, jump a bit uh, because we've said a lot in the e-retail part and we really want to hear about the second leg as well, right? So you talked about B2B and digitizing the route to market. And I guess this is huge from also covering markets with a lot of fragmented trade where you're trying to expand your coverage as well as equipping the business developers so that they can be like trusted advisors to the direct coverage customers. What is your view? What is it that you're trying to achieve? And if you think about the, the look of success, as you say, in the long run, what would that look like? Um, well, the look of success in the long run, it's an easier uh, it's an easier question, <laughs> ironically. 
because uh, I'm deeply convinced that, uh, I don't know if it's 5, 10, or 15, but probably not longer than 15 years from now, uh, all commercial interactions will be digitized in some form or the other. So I believe that all B2B interactions will be digital in some form. And even today, uh, what is called a physical interaction, like receiving an email or WhatsApp message, probably in 1985, if somebody had uh, you know, looked at that, they would say, no, no, that's totally digital already. So what I'm trying to say, I don't know what tools will be the digital tools used in 10 years, but I, I'm, I'm convinced that it is going towards 100% of uh, B2B interactions will be digitized and digital. Having this in mind, um, the role of uh, the digital lack of any B2B network is in accelerating the good things uh, that the physical network gives. What I mean, I, I often talk. I often talk to my team and I say one thing: we are digital commerce. We do digital things. We bring innovative digital things. But hey, we are selling beverages that are physical to people that are physical. So, and this is not going anywhere. So, what 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 of the working models of offline B two B route to market uh, are making a company successful? What we said before: having distribution fulfilling the orders, which means fulfilling the orders of, of, of our B2B customers, making sure that there are the right materials and equipment there, ensuring that we process their payments to us fast uh, and giving them flexible logistic services. This is all of these things that happen in the offline world. If you bring them to digital, you can do all those things 24 seven without having to be present next to them physically. Like this stupid, simple example is, order taken, you don't have to wait for your sales rep, you can order anytime you want, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, understanding deeper, innovative products. Of course, a story told by sales rep helps you, but if you can access any time and read up the marketing story and the technical story of any new product that is offered, it, it gives you, you know, better insights into how you want to leverage this product for your business. Uh, processing, boring things like processing claims and uh, you know, financial areas, discussions, and so on, that take time and phone calls and finding the right person. If you bring it on an EB2B platform, all of a sudden this can all go much, much faster. Uh, you can tailor your marketing messages through digital platforms exactly to the segments of your customers based on their needs and even go as granular as each customer is an individual segment, you know. And, and you give them those specific marketing messages that will drive their business better based on the insights you generate from their interaction with your B2B platform. And so it's quite conceptual what I'm describing, but if you if you put all of these things, you know, on a, on a piece of paper, and then you say, okay, let's see, let's try to, to understand how difficult each of them is to, to build and uh, how much time it takes, how much money, and how much output it gives in short term. Uh, in terms of business uh, improvement and uh, customer value, then you prioritize and then you start building them one by one. And I believe this is the way that this future where everybody will be digitally connected will emerge. But you understand the logic. Digital yeah. you is enabling, accelerating, and supporting the existing physical model, uh, which is there for a reason. I don't believe that, uh, I don't believe the story is that something digital will come and disrupt everything and you know, everybody will disappear and uh, chatbots will be serving robots and... Uh, and the and AI and drink, god and drink, of uh, Elon Musk. Yeah, don't get me wrong, we deploy all of those tools, but yeah. I, I do believe that it's still about, I mean, in CPGs at least, it's about physical mm -hmm. people and physical products. Uh, okay. You're very right. And we recently had in our uh, podcast also Sanil D'Souza, who's uh, the CEO of Tata Consumer Goods, and we're talking about India, uh, where it's like 80% fragmented traditional trade. And he was like explaining us how all these digital solutions are enabling uh, the companies to try and get distribution while, while it's super difficult with the physical on the ground to route to market exactly because of the particularities, let's say, of uh, India. Uh, would you like to share with us a little bit more about the solutions that you guys at the HPC have already? Because we know that you're doing some exciting stuff and also partnering with other companies, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, for our direct to market, where we directly deliver to mm -hmm. our clients, uh, 
uh, we have our own trademark tool that is called uh, Coca-Cola Hellenic Customer Portal, mm -hmm. where our customers can uh, order our products. Uh, they get access to some services like analytics. They can, uh, uh, for example, see how their coolers are performing, like uh, are the number of door openings uh, in line with what peer group is having or should they maybe move the cooler? It's one specific use case that I'm telling you that they can have access to, for example. Um, they can see uh, very detailed descriptions uh, and whatever technical information they need about the products and marketing information. They get uh, their digital marketing segmented messages uh, where we use uh, technologies, uh, including AI to drive the segmentation and um, customization of message generations. Uh, and this, this tool, Customer Portal, is constantly evolving. It is quite scaled, uh, uh, meaning in all, all the markets where we are present, it's uh, a sizable part of our business and uh, it's growing very fast. That's for direct route to market. For indirect route to market, where we go to outlets through wholesalers, uh, and uh, it's a different model naturally. Uh, we are developing an EB2B marketplace kind of solution that connects many outlets to many suppliers. Uh, and uh, while we are building it and um, uh, we are behind the development of this thing, obviously wholesalers that are on this platform, they sell not only our products, they sell other products as well, including, by the way, competitive products. And, uh, and that's okay. Um, so, so that is a much more complex program because of uh, multiple interactions, multiple suppliers, multiple buyers. And sometimes they buy, they don't buy from a single source, the same product. Sometimes they buy the same product from multiple sources. And of course it's multi-category coverage. So the assortment that is covered by, by marketplace is obviously much higher. Uh, as you can understand, there are some things and uh, solutions that we can deploy across both platforms because they are similar. And there are some things that are quite unique to one route to market model or the other route to market model. And that's why it requires customization and customized development. Um, we obviously partner with uh, software providers and companies which provide us the technology to build these things. We are not a, mm -hmm. we're a company, we are not uh, building and uh, software engineering. Proprietary us. tech. Uh... Kind no, of it, stuff. It, yes. is, it is proprietary model, right? It is our yeah. model, but the architecture behind it uh, needs to be it's outsourced. Yeah, it, it needs to be scalable and quite mm -hmm. often, not only, not only, but it's quite often, or in most cases, it's software as a service, different elements okay. into, yeah. into the architecture, and it's quite simple. This way, you can you can scale it much faster, right? Because mm -hmm. whatever is custom made, it's it's more tailored to your needs today. But it may be that you need tomorrow change or in a different market, your needs are different and you can't scale it. So we, we follow this philosophy to create scalable solutions. And as I said before, uh, we believe that technology is less important than business opportunity and understanding it. There is technology for any business need. It's much more mm -hmm. tricky to understand what you want and what value you create for the customer. And you will always find technology for that. That's the philosophy of how we are building our EB2B in particular. And what about uh, D2C? In FMCG, it seems to go in waves. Sometimes it's cool and sometimes it's not. Sometimes they say it's the future. Sometimes they say it's not viable. What's your particular experience been with it? Well, in general, it depends on the product, of course. And again, it starts with the consumer. Um, I believe that in our particular product categories, uh, one needs to answer, and it's not that I have an answer to this question. I know, I, I know the question. I, the, the answers, you know, there are opinions about the answer. Uh, the question that I'm asking myself always is, if I'm a consumer and I'm offered to buy directly online uh, beverages, why would I do this shopping act separately from my other groceries purchases, right? And then, depending on the answer, you believe or you do not believe in building an exclusive beverage platform that will only deliver beverages to consumers. Um, and there are different, there are different uh, experiments going on, and I don't believe there is a clear answer to this question that everybody can believe. Like people be believe yes, there is a chance. People believe no, there is no chance. I believe like if there is a chance, why would they shop for this separately from other groceries? Probably because there is something else. 
service, returnables, exclusive products that you cannot buy in other, like there must be some reason why you do it, right? And once you have formulated those reasons, you need to ask yourself, okay, how big will it be? So is it even worth investing and trying to do it? How big can it be at maximum? And, and once you also like check, check, positive, positive, which is a big assumption that you have both positives, then we'll be a third thing, okay, what will be your average drop size? And can you make it economically viable to, to mm -hmm. deliver this? In beverages, we are relatively cheap, unless it's, uh, Christina, we talked about Diageo, okay, when, when it's high-end uh, premium spirits, it may be different because your value of the drop is much higher. But if you go into non-alcoholic beverages, it's difficult to make any economics work if it's only about beverages, right? right. So, so, so if you find a model that at least conceptually has a clear answer, yes, 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 to those four questions that I mentioned, then probably you should give it a shot. Uh, and as real world is not black or white, it's, it's normally different shades of gray, you will probably discover that in some places, I guess very few, you can find a way to make all four things work and then you should try it. In many places you cannot, so there's no universal answer. And sometimes mm -hmm. it can, sometimes it may not work. And uh, you need to be very clear what are the criteria of success before you try to do it. That's that's my view, and that's essentially how we do it. Like, okay. if, yeah, if you ask me, is there a one scaled platform for beverages that I know that caters directly to consumers? No, I don't know one. Uh, well, it kind of makes sense, right? Because what we tend to forget is that when you're in an FMCG world, you look at things as marketing tools, while in fact, a platform is a product on its own. It's a digital product and it needs to solve for a problem, a shopper, in that case, a user has, and it needs to bring its own value. Otherwise, the product, the digital one, is not viable. And then, of course, as you said, the economics of the thing need to work. And I will just build on with one last question on that topic, because I know there is a frenzy about first party data. And that's also the reason why many companies jump into the D2C wagon, because they really want to get first party data from our consumers, first party data, shopping data. Um, do you think that there is a risk for those companies that cannot uh, have their own direct relationship with their shoppers, seeing how the th things are evolving? Yeah, there is, uh, for sure, there is such a risk, right? It's obvious. And that's why, and also for that risk, the, there must be, there must be a strategy. They must have a strategy how, how they deal with that risk. And there are different strategies that can be there, mm -hmm. right? One thing is you, you may agree data sharing because you say, listen, if if you try to develop to, to, to whoever is between you and your shopper, you can tell them if you if you run it transactionally and try to try to isolate me from, from the data about my shoppers and consumers, uh, you will forego some opportunities I could give to accelerate joint business and create better experience for them. So you may lose competitive advantage compared to somebody else who is not having that limitation for me, right? So it's, it can be an open alpha conversation. Uh, if, if you still realize that, hey, I don't have access to my shopper data and the channels that are growing faster for my business today are the ones where I have zero, zero visibility, you need to plan that one day you will you will be out of business and how to deal with that so I'm going back is one is a conversation if the conversation is not working how do you do it you need to have brands strong enough that that you cannot be ignored right somebody somebody who has your shopper still needs to offer to your to, to the shopper something and you need to be that something without which mm -hmm. they cannot have a sustainable model and right. that's how you make that's how you make the conversation equalized. If be the one who brings the traffic. Yeah. If you don't have the brand that brings traffic, if you don't have the data about your shoppers, if you don't, if you're no, 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 then okay, then prepare to be out of business or fix that. Like there is yeah. no magic recipe. And by the way, is it that different in offline worlds? I wouldn't say. And and Vitaly, we talked at the beginning about the career that you've had. Um, having been a GM, now rectifying, I think it's 14 years total, right? J&J, and, &J, and then when you started at Hellenic. Um, but anyway, looking at the career you've had, like having a commercial role, general management, now going into digital, if you went back to your younger self at the beginning of your career, what would be that one piece of advice you would give yourself with the lessons learned? Uh, even looking back, I think, 
it w- it went well, and the only thing it would be like reassurance. Yes, it will be scary every time you change, but don't worry. It's okay to be scared. It's okay. Just move forward. This was Vitaly Novikov, a Group Digital Director at Coca-Cola Hellenic. Christina, what are your takeaways? First of all, I loved how we talked about the multifaceted uh, uh, view of what digital is in a company, right? Because a lot of people tend to think that it's either just marketing or just e-commerce. Well, here we discussed about, um, first of all, talking about e-commerce, selling through retailers, selling through FSAs, Quickcom, and so on. Then it's all about digitizing the route to market, but also building those direct relationships with the consumer in the way that it actually makes sense through DTC. And then the last part is actually about upskilling the organization. And that's a huge thing. Like you cannot expect an aging and uh, organization that has the skills of the previous century to march into the future and win, right? So it's a big bet to be able to translate into the existing language everything that's new and happening and ensuring that you can build a strategy and then also get the full organization behind it. Yeah. And how did you feel about the fact of like really linking that online experience with the brand to the in-store part? Well, I think that uh, perhaps we started somewhere in that space when we were doing the intro for that video, right? Um, The fact that we need to start thinking omnichannel and we need to get the different parts of the company to start speaking to each other because it's only one shopper and one consumer and they go through the whole journey and they expect it to be seamless. We do expect, we do already see actually in the physical stores to have uh, digital displays and digital touch points, even some QR codes or having some Bluetooth beacons and interacting with your mobile while you are in the store. And we will be seeing more of that and what's called like the digital thing. But then also you just simply scroll or search for something on your mobile and then you casually enter your neighborhood store. And what you have just seen online represents a brand that then needs to have the exact same image and feeling and experience for you when you walk into that store, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Christina, as always, for your conclusions. Thanks for our guests for joining us today in this episode with Vitaly Novikov. Remember, if you haven't yet, to hit that subscribe button. If you can, leave us a review, and we'll see you in the next episode of the FMCG, guys. Have a great day.